So, uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, I'm, I would like to introduce firstly uh, the, uh, the project Super G shortly on behalf of the Dr. Paul New Price, who is the scientific leader of the project and who uh, he, is, he was not able to, to join the mini meeting today. So it's his presentation and is very shortly just two slides i'd like to uh, I, i'd like to share some information about about this project so as you can see is the project which should uh, be terminated next year uh, and uh, you can you can find also the basic information on those web pages you can see in the in the blue uh, blue letters so the most important is the aim the aim of the project, as you can see, is to develop the sustainable permanent grassland system and policies uh, with farmers, with cooperation with farmers and also policymakers, who are also you, uh, that will be effective in optimizing productivity, uh, but also supporting biodiversity and deliver a number of other ecosystem services. So you will today uh, hear about some other outputs of these projects. So in these projects, there are 22 partners involved across five biogeographic regions. So we are the continental biogeogra biogeographical region. And uh, we should be focused also on benchmarking um, uh, and synthesizing data from different countries and different regions. and. Uh, there are some uh, at about 23, as you can see, farm networks within these 22 organizations. We have 17 experimental platforms and film ex uh, field experience. And uh, uh, sorry, let me just miss the connection. And uh, the impact, oh, sorry, the outcomes of this project is uh, to produce uh, some materials for farmers and policymakers and stakeholders to better understand uh, importance and functioning of permanent grasslands because it's uh, quite limiting sometimes, uh, and then increase availability and uptake of permanent grassland management options and technologies, improved competitiveness of farming system systems based on permanent grassland, what is especially challenge in the continental regions, and uh, also to try to, to uh, influence the agriculture policies that support optimal management, management of permanent grassland. And we can continue on the last slide. And you can see the some management challenges uh, for the farmers uh, who are managing permanent grasslands. Uh, the challenges are different in different uh, bioregions, but uh, some of them are the same everywhere. So uh, permanent grasslands are very, uh, very often uh, placed on the stony or shallow soils compared to arable land. It's a completely different situation. Uh, very often they are on sloping land. Uh, also, uh, they are uh, faced to extreme weather patterns, uh, much more than the arable land. Uh, some permanent grasslands uh, are facing ab abandonment. Uh, there are lack of incentives, uh, which should help to retain permanent grasslands in some countries. Weed control is a trouble, especially in organic farming. Uh, also, we are focused on improving and the, uh, the use and nutrition quality of grass. So that composition is a big, uh, big issue. Sometimes uh, we can improve it by overseeding or, uh, as you will see in the example from Hungary, some in some regions, uh, we are focused to introduce on the foc uh, to introduce native species. And uh, current issues are also with the predators, especially with wolves or bears in some countries. And I think in most countries, uh, there is a conflict between productivity 
which is the aim of farmers and ecosystem services, which are, of course, uh, the aim of some uh, protectionist and government bodies, etc. Okay, and I think it's uh, the it's all. So it was just a short introduction. What is the what is the main aim of the Super G? And uh, now we will we will start with the introduction of uh, five uh, five short presentations. And the first one will be mine about the using of Matenkle. So can I can I okay, ask please. you? Yeah, thanks. Oh, sorry. <laughs> thanks. Thanks a lot for 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 the short presentation. I think there is no need to discuss the, this uh, introduction to Super G. But uh, then, of course, uh, I'm happy to, to introduce you as well again uh, for, for the topic of, of mutton clay, red clover, which is a special thing from Switzerland, obviously, and being tested now in under conditions of uh, the Czech Republic. And yeah, you have you have the floor for your short presentation, Stanis. Mm -hmm. Please go Fine. ahead. Fine, thank you, Hans. So I need again wait for the sharing of the presentation. Uh, Dina, maybe it is the wrong screen you chose. Ah. Fine, now it's fine. So thank you, Dina. I put it. Okay, so as you can see, uh, the topic of this presentation is to uh, introduce uh, the importance of persistent red clover, which is called also Matenkle, uh, for permanent grasslands in continental bioregions. Okay, so can we move to next one? It's blocked. <laughs> oh, okay, no. now okay. it's, I can see it. <laughs> Okay, so at the, at the top you can see the, the aim of the Super G, so I don't really repeat it. But uh, in this picture you can see the typical Matenkle, which you can find uh, very commonly in your permanent, in your permanent grasslands. Uh, the term Matenkle is coming from Switzerland, where it, uh, it's commonly used. And uh, it, it means that it's persistent, persistent red clover, which was uh, selected from permanent grasslands and uh, currently there are many many cultivars of class which show uh, good ground cover in the third or even in fourth harvest year yeah so they are much more persistent than the standard acre class or the short living red clovers varieties and for establishment and overseeding of permanent grassland uh, we should preferably use these mutton clay varieties, but uh, many farmers are not aware about the existence of the differences in the persistence uh, of red clovers. So one of the aim of this presentation is to in introduce the, the differences which are important for farmers. Uh, red clover is a very important uh, forage for uh, our permanent grasslands because it's not very demanding on soil fertility, and uh, it can also fix a huge amount of nitrogen from the air at about 300 kilos per hectare and produce very good quality and yield of forage. So uh, its presence in permanent grasslands is very, very welcome by, by farmers. Can we go on? Fine. Here you can see the differences between the uh, between the cultivated red clovers on the left side, what is some tetrapoid cultivar and cultivar, and on the right side you can see the short uh, and very small plant of white red clover. So uh, these wild types are very common, especially in continental bioregion. I think in all countries, but uh, it's not very productive, as you can see. 
and uh, we also found that it's also not very persistent. Many people think that uh, it's very persistent uh, because you can find it for the long period in the in the grasslands, but uh, usually it's uh, it just spread by seeds in the aftermath. So uh, the persistence is not very very uh, very big uh, compared to standard cultivated uh, cultivars. But what is also very uh, different is the size and the productivity of the cultivated uh, cultivated red clovers varieties. So you can see it's uh, very important also to introduce some new varieties to your sword to improve the productivity. So the same species can be very different. Okay, can be moved. Perfect. Uh, here is the slide uh, showing the differences uh, between uh, the legumes, in this case red clover on the right side, and pure grasses. This is the picture from the Bohemian Moravian Highland, uh, what it's quite a humid area, but uh, during the summer there are some dry spells. And you can see completely different reaction of the legumes, which are more drought resistant. And also they are not dependent, dependent on the nitrogen fertilizing. And on the left side, you can see perennial ryegrass, which is a very common grass, especially in Western Europe, which was not fertilized in this uh, the third growth. And also the tolerance of drought is much lower compared to red clover. So you can see if you have included uh, red clover in your stands, the productivity can be dramatically increased. So that's the reason why we are so focused on the red clover introduction to permanent grassland. Okay, can you go on? Unfortunately, there are some troubles with this clover uh, persistence and Usually the main reason, especially in, in the Central European region, uh, is the occurrence of uh, fungi uh, fusarium, which can damage the crown or the root system of red clover. And uh, it's probably the main reason for the low persistence of some cultivars. So you can see the damaged plants uh, in, the, in the left picture. Uh, in the right picture, you can see the old plant in the fourth harvest year, and the root system is quite damaged by fungi. So it's not so big as it should be. So this is the biggest trouble with the, the persistence of red clover. clover. Okay. Uh, you can see the detail of the root damage. Sometimes even in the first harvest year, you can find most of the plants which are damaged by this uh, fungi, but they can survive for a couple of years, but uh, the vitality and productivity is lowered. Uh, this is the picture from our resource station in Watin in the uh, Bohemian Moravian Highland, what is the typical uh, or where the red clover is the very important forage for the dairy herds and also for other types of cattle. And uh, in this case, we tested the persistence of about 20 different red clovers. Okay, can we go on? Uh, I apologize for so many numbers, uh, but uh, I, we will we will be focused just on some of them. Uh, in this picture, you can see the table from our previous trial, and uh, there is the list of varieties we tested, and. Uh, in the third column, you can see the cover of the red clover in the fourth harvest year. And you can see that some varieties, four of them, uh, are able to keep the, the share in the stand, the proportion above the 30%, what is great uh, in the fourth harvest year. And those varieties should be uh, should be preferred for oversowing or establishment of permanent grasslands. You can see that there are some varieties on the other side of this of this list, and uh, they they have very low persistence. And there is also wild ecotype, which is also not very persistent. So this is this is the trial which was uh, terminated already. We established a new one, but uh, we are now in the third harvest year, so I couldn't use the uh, current current re uh, results for this uh, 
to this uh, for this list, and uh, there are also some new varieties which has which should have very good persistence. So just uh, for for you is the most important the third third column uh, to com compare the different varieties uh, with uh, with the persistence. Okay, can we go on? Uh, this is the picture from this trial, so you can see that there are some uh, some plots which are uh, which are very good on the left side. For example, there is the plot in the fourth harvest year where there is very good cover of red clover. Uh, in the middle, on the right side, you can see the plots with very low uh, proportion of red clover. We established this trial with seventy percent of red clover in the mixture and thirty percent grasses, meadow fescue, and, and timothy. And in the right bottom picture, you can see, again, the differences that uh, in the middle there is variety, very persistent variety, uh, while on the other two plots, uh, the persistence of red clover is much, much lower. OK, can we go on? And probably the last or last but one picture, or slide, sorry, uh, shows the uh, the different ways how we can overseed the red clover to uh, to permanent grasslands, so we can use uh, the disc uh, disc uh, seeder on the top, or just uh, broadcasting, uh, which is used uh, very commonly in Austria or in regions where there are high precipitations. And on the left picture, you can see in the left picture you can see the stand which was overseeded by red clover with very good proportion of red clover. Unfortunately, you need to repeat it every fourth or fifth year uh, to keep the good proportion of red clover and replace some areas of red clover on arable land, so you can save uh, your land for some other market crops, for example. Okay, can you go on? So the last are the conclusions. So we need persistent cultivars for improvement of uh, for improvement of permanent grassland. Sorry. Uh, so there are differences, significant differences in persistence among red clover cultivars. But uh, usually farmers are not aware uh, of the differences. The most persistent uh, cultivars are called matenkle. And uh, there are four of them, but unfortunately, I, I think that some of them are not multiplied and and uh, are not on market anymore. Uh, tetraploids are not, uh, or at least in our trial, they were not more persistent than diploids. Uh, usually, breeders uh, are uh, are explaining that tetraploids are more persistent, but uh, it's not generally true. And uh, last, uh, lastly, the wild ecotype of red clover was not more persistent uh, or had not good persistence compared to cultivated cultivars. And I think that's the final slide now. Yes. So that's all from me. And thank you for the listening. Thank you. Thank you, Stanislav, for this insight in, in, in your research on, on red clover. Uh, I have to keep an eye on, on the time, but maybe one question could be allowed. And then we will have the opportunity, am I right, to discuss particular items, items later on in the breakout groups. Yes. Okay, but one, one question is, is possible at the moment. I'm just wondering, please uh, raise your hand. I'm just wondering, trying to follow. Uh, well, there is no, no urgent need for a question so far. There is one, one thing I was, would like to ask Stanislav is, uh, there is, in, in our situation, there, farmers are always afraid to, I mean, they like red clover, but they, they fear, or there is a risk of clover being so dominant and then just uh, uh, diminishing in one year. So you have a mass of a grass wart thereafter. Is this a topic also in your country? Ah, yes, you are right. Uh, that can be a trouble, especially with the short living varieties. Uh, uh, but also the seeding rate uh, of the red clover for overseeding or for especially for the establishment of new grassland shouldn't be higher than three kilos per hectare. 
because otherwise you are right it's too aggressive and yeah. can diminish uh, the poorer or slower species that's true okay, okay. so thank you uh, then thanks Stanislav again uh, and then we will switch to the second presentation as far as I uh, I'm aware it should be Damien Godfroy am I right and uh, yeah please uh, Dina could you could you put on the the presentation of Damir, or is it Damir? Do you manage yourself? Right. -o. But anyhow, I can use the time to introduce Damir. Um, he's, a, he's an extension officer at the uh, Chambre d'Agriculture des Vosges. Uh, so it's the west, the, the eastern part of France. And, and he's, he's involved in, in uh, grassland extension business and uh, closely dealing with farmers. So we are keen to, 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 hear, um, to hear about your, your presentation of, of the introduction of grassland forbs, uh, a very topical uh, thing, uh, into permanent grassland swords. So please, go ahead, Damien. OK, thank you for the introduction. Um, so I will present you the, the results of our test uh, about feasibility of overseeding uh, plantain uh, in uh, Lorraine. Uh, so uh, our farmers uh, faced to, uh, since several years to uh, very dry and warm summer, and uh, they try to improve the performance of uh, their grassland with new species. Um, and in the in these spaces, uh, we we have to to choose between the chicory and the plantain for our test uh, because these two species are very uh, persistent and resistant to uh, dry uh, condition. Uh, we finally choose plantain because because um, it's more. Uh, uh, possible to to graze than uh, chicory. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's it's okay. Thank you, Dina. Uh, we have uh, five uh, five sites uh, for our test uh, with two years of uh, sowing. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, we, I I think. Since uh, I think like uh, everyone here, uh, we had uh, three very different years with 2020 and 2022 with uh, dry summer and uh, 2021 with very uh, humid and rainy uh, summer. So very different conditions. Our uh, testing plots are all in permanent grassland. Uh, it's uh, in uh, rotational grazing, uh, and uh, the soils are very uh, clay or uh, clay loam uh, soil. Um, we don't have any uh, experimental farms. Uh, all our tests are made uh, with the farmers um, in commercial farms. Uh, we oversold with uh, planting one plot, and uh, we have in uh, each uh, site, uh, site one uh, control plot. And the plantain we choose is Ceresthonic uh, or Boston, but a lot of uh, site was with Ceresthonic. And we did check the number of plantain in uh, the evolution of the number of plantain in the years. Um, so we overseeing seeding in September uh, 2019 uh, and 2021 uh, after the summer in each uh, year. And uh, with a very high density, it's uh, higher than those, uh, the seeding density in a temporary grassland because we want to check if the um, plantain is able to uh, to growing in a permanent grassland uh, without destroying this permanent grassland. Uh, the results, um, 
we saw the a quite good implementation of the plantain, but a very important loss of the of the plants during the first year, as you can see in the the graph. Um, and uh, this very low number of plants by a meter square uh, does plantain uh, doesn't contribute significantly to the to the yield. Uh, you can see in the picture there is just uh, one or two plants in uh, this. Uh, this uh, quadrat. Uh, so our conclusion uh, now, it's uh, uh, in uh, it's, uh, our tests are not uh, successful, and um, plantain do not uh, are very uh, are not uh, plantain don't have a good uh, sustainability uh, in the time. Uh, and we saw the same thing in a temporary grassland in our uh, type of soils. Uh, so we have uh, some hypothesis about this uh, fails. It's uh, maybe uh, plantains need more uh, sandy soils or acid soils. Uh, we have to check that. And uh, the other uh, hypothesis is um, the plantain is not aggressive enough to resist in permanent grassland. So it's our uh, main hypothesis now. Thank you for your, your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Damien, for presenting these interesting results perfectly in time. And there's also time for, for a few questions. So please uh, indicate, raise your hands. We've got questions. Uh, if there is no one, I, I may, may start. How was the, or to what extent, might the management of the grasslands after you have oversown plantain, how could that have affected the low performance? Mm. Um, generally, the, after the overseeding, there was uh, no pasture uh, before the spring after the, the, the seeding. So I don't think there is a very uh, high impact of this practice on the, the results. Uh, but maybe uh, there is a, after uh, in a rotational grazing, uh, lots of uh, 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 animals in a, in a small area. So maybe after there is a degradation of uh, planting. Okay. Okay, so it might be the heavy grazing not be so suitable for plantain. Mm, maybe. Okay, right, thanks. Um, are there more questions? It does not be to seem the case. So then again, thanks, Damien, for presenting <clears throat> the, the short presentation. And I will then hand over to Laura Zavataro. Uh, Laura, do you have the presentation or Dina? And I'm also going to introduce Laura. Um, she's, she's a senior scientist um, at the University of Torino, Ita Italy. And, and she has a particular interest in, in, in soil and soil health and environment and the effect of, of agricultural practices. And she's also working with grasslands and today she's going to present um, the topic of irrigation of grasslands, uh, obviously under condition of Northern Italy. So please, Laura, go ahead. Thank you very much. So my duty today is to, uh, to talk about the irrigation of grassland. Irrigation of grassland was, uh, was performed from ancient times all throughout Europe. And grassland was the, the main land use that was irrigated in ancient times, both in southern Europe, uh, where part of the water was instead devoted to, to other crops, but in particular in Central Europe. Uh, nowadays, it's quite difficult to find out uh, how uh, what is the, uh, the share of irrigated grassland in Europe. So there are some estimations. One uh, uh, that is quite recent says that 10% of the utilized agricultural area is occupied by irrigated grassland. 
And as you can see, they are mostly concentrated in Italy and in the Po Plain, uh, but also in Spain, Portugal, Greece, but unexpectedly from my point of view, also in the Netherlands, Denmark and Scandinavia. So uh, grassland was the main land use that needed irrigation in the past and uh, uh, the need of irrigating um, crops and grassland has shaped uh, the landscape all throughout Europe. Here you can see uh, a piece of land uh, in, in my region, which is Piemonte, northwestern Italy. As you can see, there are some permanent ditches that run uh, along the contour lines. There are fields are rather small. And uh, they uh, all around the the fields there are um, ditches. Some of them are permanent, some of them are temporary, and they run all across the fields because they are needed to to deliver irrigation water and to collect uh, drainage water uh, after surface irrigation. Uh, other waterworks have also um, changed the landscape of our uh, of our lands, such as the waterworks needed to deliver uh, to deliver water in, in great amounts. And these canals from uh, the first picture is from Italy, the second one from Moravia. So why should grassland be irrigated? Uh, well, the, the first reason that comes to our mind is to increase the, the, the production of biomass in, uh, in summer. And so there are several studies uh, uh, conducted in, uh, throughout Europe. Uh, here you can see just some examples of the kind of uh, information that we can derive from those, uh, from those studies, such as the, the increase due to uh, adding irrigation water or the yield decrease due to the suspension of irrigation in a previously irrigated uh, grassland. Then some other studies tend to, um, to give a quantification of the amount of dry matter that can produce by each uh, uh, cubic meter of irrigation water. So irrigation uh, can increase the, the production in, in the drought season. But uh, irrigation was, uh, uh, can also be used to increase the biomass production in winter and early spring. And uh, this was uh, one of the most ancient uses of irrigation in, in Europe. So irrigation can stabilize production both within the year, but also between the years due to the variability of rainfall. Irrigation can also help to, um, to keep uh, on the field some species that suffer for uh, hot during summer and suffer for drought during summer, uh, such, such as some, uh, um, some grasses. In the past, in particular, um, irrigation uh, was, uh, could deliver to, to the fields some solutes and sediments that helped uh, fertilizing uh, poor soils. But nowadays, uh, uh, in a similar way, uh, irrigation can be used to deliver uh, fertilizers, in particular organic fertilizers, such as uh, dilute slurry. Such as, and this is uh, an, an example is, uh, is in the picture you can see here. In the past in particular, but also nowadays irrigation, in particular, um, uh, flooding uh, grassland can help controlling some pests and some animals. And uh, uh, flooding can also recharge the groundwater and the groundwater can be used downstream for other uses. So it is not a waste of water, but it is a transformation of water from the surface where it can flow down to, to the sea just and that transforming into groundwater that can be used downstream and pump for other uses. Uh, irrigation can also provide uh, the land with the uh, uh, retention areas that can be useful um, to, uh, during floods. So both fields can be flooded and ditches can be flooded. It's an extra um, volume that can be filled with water during floods. So protect uh, the um, the civil areas. Here you can see some pictures that regard winter irrigation or grassland. And there, so it, it was used in, in an area that was uh, very rich with, uh, with water and water um, uh, 
uh, field uh, spring out of, of the soil. So a very, very, very shallow groundwater. Uh, this system was uh, developed by the Roman times, uh, but in particular at the end of, of the Middle Ages. So it was used to uh, to help grass to to recover after after winter and start uh, winter and start producing very soon uh, in early spring, and also to uh, to remove uh, to help snow melt. Uh, during winter, not only in uh, in Italy, uh, but there are also other areas in Europe where this uh, irrigation uh, at the end of winter was used. Uh, this kind of irrigation required a lot of man manpower because uh, fields had to be very very leveled uh, so that water did not um, uh, bring out uh, uh, did not uh, erode the soil. Here you can see other uh, old photos regarding uh, irrigation in mountain areas, in particular in the northwestern Alps where I where I live. And so this this kind of uh, um, uh, gravity systems required uh, a network of of, uh, of ditches along contour lines and. Uh, uh, and require a lot of manpower, both when when they uh, had to be built and maintained by the by the community of uh, of villages, but also when irrigation was performed. Nowadays things have changed, and uh, but in any case, gravity systems have remained the main systems that are used to irrigate grassland in Italy. Uh, yeah, uh, they they can use water from uh, from surface water in some cases also groundwater and uh, uh, canals or uh, buried pipes can be used to irrigate grassland. This kind of system requires a, a lot of water, uh, but the good news is that uh, groundwater recharge is a uh, is a good benefit from this kind of uh, uh, of, of irrigation. Precious systems uh, such as sprinklers, here you can see a big gun and here a ranger or, or, or pivot systems are much less used in, in a, at least in my country. And they are, um, uh, they, uh, their use is increasing because they require less amount of water. So for water saving purposes, these systems are much more used. Uh, some uh, publications have compared the two methods and they seem to have the same effect on yield and some the similar effect on on, uh, uh, on the soil composition, at least in the short term, uh, although it seems that white clover is uh, uh, more promoted when using uh, sprinkler irrigation than when using um, uh, flooding or surface irrigation. What, what about the mountains? Well, um, we, we, uh, in the mountains, we can use uh, uh, sprinklers that are um, nowadays, uh, this system is, uh, is uh, more adapted than, uh, than uh, surface irrigation with mobile systems, such as the ones that you can see here in the um, top uh, uh, picture here on your, on your right. Uh, but there have been also some big investments in, uh, in Valle d'Aosta, which is in the northwest of Italy, where you can see there are buried pipes and uh, temporary sprinklers and mobile sprinklers that are put, every, uh, put in place every season to irrigate grassland. This required a lot of investments for sure. Where uh, can irrigation of grassland um, go in, in the future with the problem of uh, water shortage? Well, uh, one uh, direction could be uh, the development of uh, systems that uh, use um, uh, weather data and the simulation of uh, uh, soil uh, water balance to, to understand when it is time to irrigate and how much water should be, uh, should be devoted to irrigation, how much water should be supplied to, to grassland. And in this case, this system can be um, uh, applied using sprinkler irrigation. This is a project that we have here in Northwestern Italy. Another project that is ongoing uh, 
uh, in, uh, in the Eastern Po Plain is instead, uh, instead uses uh, surface irrigation and automated closures combined with the soil water sensors to decide when is the moment to irrigate, also combined with the perfect knowledge of, uh, of the uh, soil status, both in terms of, uh, of slope and uh, characteristics of the soil. Uh, using this kind of irrigation, so surface irrigation uh, uses a lot of water, but um, here, at least here in Italy, uh, grassland is not over fertilized and uh, all, um, all research show that uh, there is uh, almost no risk of uh, polluting the groundwater because the amount of uh, nitrate in our grassland is always very, very low. So just to conclude, climate is changing, but also the objectives of agriculture and land use are always changing. So it's a changing environment. And uh, uh, this means that uh, uh, grassland is increasing its, uh, its surface in Europe and irrigation of permanent grassland uh, should be revisited. So we should continue to, to irrigate grassland. Although the, uh, most of grassland have stopped seeing irrigation because it was devoted to more profitable crops. And there is a competition of water uh, due to the fact that uh, water, uh, due to the water shortage that we are facing in Europe. Uh, so uh, distribution methods that guarantee water saving should be better applied, but this needs a lot of investments, both in manpower and uh, in, uh, in money that uh, should be delivered by public bodies. So that's all, thank you very much. Thank you, Laura, for this uh, nice overview on, on, on irrigation of grasslands. Uh, are there questions? Maybe one or two questions can be allowed. Well, I'm just, when I miss, please just talk. Uh, if this is not the case, and I have one question, Laura. Uh, you, you showed uh, water use efficiency of irrigation water being about roughly three kilograms per ton of water. Um, how variable, how variable do you consider is this value? Or it's one, two to three, no, two, yeah, two to three kilogram. How, how valuable uh, is this depending on the way how, or the technique that is utilized to irrigate? Uh, I think they are very variable, not only depending on, on the method to deliver water, but also depending on the status of, uh, of, the, of the grassland and on the soil itself. So this is just an example because I found very contrasting, uh, uh, contrasting uh, values. And it, it also depends on, on, uh, uh, on the rainfall amount because uh, the response of, uh, of production to uh, any um, uh, productivity factor, well, it, it, is, uh, it is not a linear relationship, but it is a curvy linear relationship. So it depends on, on when we start from. Any, any response to this production factor depends on the starting point. Yeah, okay, yeah, thanks. Um, more questions? Well, if this is not the case, then again, thank you very much, Laura, for, for this presentation. And we are then switching to uh, Esther, maybe? Maybe Esther, are you yes. prepared? Yes, I'm prepared. <laughs> okay, so then I, I again ask Dina to, oh, it's already on the screen, is it? Yeah, uh, Yeah, you. then I, I, I shortly introduce uh, Esther Lelai Kovac. Um, she's Dr. Dr. Lelai Kovac, she's a senior scientist at the Center for Ecological Research uh, in Vakratot near Budapest. Um, and she, her particular interest is in, in, in working on, on carbon um, cycling, uh, soil respiration, um, and, and in, in relation to climate change. And she has quite a bit of experiences with, with uh, uh, experiments in continental dry grasslands and also looking at the impact of, of grassland management. So, and today she, she will be talking about the resilience of dry perennial ryegrass, obviously under 
conditions of the continental conditions of Hungary and, and the, the impact of oversowing with native species. So it's a bit related to what we've heard by Damien Godfroy. So please, Esther, go ahead. Thank you very much. So greeting from Hungary. I, I would like to um, introduce my uh, our uh, experiment in a, a gra dry grassland in Hungary, especially on a, uh, um, in an experiment on biodiversity, productivity, and the resilience. Uh, the goals, uh, you can see that was mentioned more times, uh, the Super G project is uh, to maintain bo both uh, sustainable uh, permanent grasslands with uh, high biodiversity and at the same time uh, with uh, optimal uh, productivity and other ecosystem services. And in that uh, sense, we, uh, I, I would um, uh, like to show our, our follow our seeding experiment, but the, the main challenge in that uh, case is the drought and the, and, the, and the low productivity of the soil. So first, I, I would uh, show some uh, cases when the soil uh, has uh, much threats and, uh, and uh, how could we solve this problem. So the, uh, in the next, um, you can uh, see that the, the, the soils become more thinner and infertile and the, the agriculture overuse is also a problem. And the fertilization is in our um, area also not a, not a solution in our soils. And the irrigation when the, when the, the climate is very uh, uh, hot and uh, dry uh, during summer is also not a problem because of the high risk of alkalinization and, and uh, the much uh, more um, exploitation of, of the soil. So it is not a solution. The next, uh, next slide, you can see also uh, further threats. Uh, yeah, the contamination of soils and, and as well as the groundwater and some uh, on our uh, area when the overgrazing is also a problem when this uh, very low productivity soils, too much uh, animals uh, are there. So uh, the, the soil can be totally um, bare and open. And the, the extraction of soils is also uh, when, when they want to uh, make building and then uh, take of all the soils and take another uh, place, then um, uh, it may distract totally the structure of the soil. Uh, in the next slide, I, I have showed it. Yeah, uh, which is totally uh, destroyed then and uh, cannot uh, um, um, fulfill the, the main, main uh, function of the soil. So in the next uh, slide, you can see the consequences of that. Yeah, of course, the, um, know these uh, many threats. And uh, in the next slide, uh, there, there are some solutions for that when the soil, pre for soil production options uh, 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 permanent ground coverage, composting, limited soil rotation, avoiding fertilization, and and uh, organ uh, or using organic fertilizers if, if needed. But uh, in our case, it is not um, an option. Uh, and in the next slide, you can see the the our uh, main uh, points of our experiments in the overseeding experiment in the Kishkunshag, where the fields were abandoned um, around 10, uh, uh, more than 10 years ago, and uh, this uh, soil was arable land before. But now uh, the uh, econ economical transitions and also privatization uh, and decreasing livestock uh, caused uh, that these were abandoned. And also, uh, some so many uh, areas were overtaken by the by the national park, and the national park rules also um, make very strict um, um, messages. So they they cannot uh, so measures. So they uh, cannot do anything. So they cannot fertilize the soils and uh, cannot be uh, also irrigated. 
the fields uh, remain that species poor, but with low biomass. Even if before the uh, before it was uh, uh, arable land, they were uh, uh, species rich and many uh, uh, sand grass uh, species were there. So now the I hypothesis that the native species availability is limited uh, all around the, the landscape. So that is why there are not too many species come back after 10 years uh, also. And the soil nutrient limitation is also a problem. And uh, to cope with the, uh, these problems, um, in the next, uh, uh, you can see that the site, yeah, uh, the site characteristics just uh, show uh, the meteorology. Uh, we have uh, 500 millimeter uh, precipitation a year. Uh, the July uh, peak uh, uh, temperature is very high, and as well in, in the January, uh, the, th the 30 years average is the weather, and also the soil. Um, Characteristics uh, are very uh, extreme because of the high uh, sand content of the soil. And uh, we have alkaline soil um, all over. And the soil ordering matter uh, is uh, pretty low, but uh, it is a, uh, it comes as a medium because of the high sand content. So the, the, the soil, the, these nutrients can be, uh, are available for the plants. And uh, the nitrogen content is, is highly variable soil. And uh, uh, the experiment uh, uh, was uh, for reestablishment the native plant community, preventing weeds and invasive plants as a threat, and uh, for humus formation, improving soil life, increasing biomass, and uh, of course, uh, all is uh, with a cooperation with farmers with, uh, who uh, offered uh, their areas for us for our experiment. So this, uh, we had uh, not only one or two, but uh, 11 uh, plant species, uh, a mixture of plant species. They, they were uh, selected by, uh, they had to be locally occurring and native non-protected plant species with a, a, a wide range of, of flowering uh, time. Uh, and uh, in functionality for pollina pollinators, they, are, uh, they have a wide range. So that was the, the aim. And in the next slide, uh, you can see uh, the plants so highly variable in color, size, flowering time, so everything. So, so uh, it was very important to introduce many uh, species to fulfill the, the biodiversity uh, and also the, also the, the uh, biomass uh, uh, aim. And uh, uh, for that, um, yeah. <laughs> the next, yeah. Um, then the results and, and the main problem. So successful overseeding was uh, um, increased the biomass. You can see that on the uh, upper pictures. So the left was the control and the right was the oversaw uh, over uh, soil. And mostly the onobrichis uh, species uh, was abundant, but in other places, the antilles uh, as well. So had a very nice uh, result in that. And with the biomass together, the soil activity, soil respiration uh, was higher. The plant diversity increased as well, and the pollinators uh, abundance and also the species uh, richness increased. But in uh, some cases, we had unsuccessful, unsuccessful uh, uh, treatment when the, the um, germination of the uh, seeds uh, could not fulfill expect, uh, expectations, could not cope with drought, for example. It, it could be also um, uh, uh, a reason. We have more um, hypothesis, but what was the, why was, were these uh, soils um, uh, experiment uh, unsuccessful. 
We had also some uh, problems also with the grazing and trampling at some uh, parcels when the when the overgrazing could not stop, <laughs> and uh, and uh, many damages uh, come in the first year of the of the sowing and when the the seeds are uh, sensitive, and uh, it could be also a reason for uh, that seed predation in in, a, in, a, in an area where no grazing was uh, 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 took place but uh, the ground square square was very 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 uh, high abundant and uh, uh, also a hypothesis that in a place where where the germination was totally uh, failed and and could not uh, um, come out any any uh, uh, or, or so any uh, seed could not um, seedling. Uh, did, it could be that uh, in a previous time, uh, for example, with the vineyard, uh, could many pesticides in the soil um, uh, income, and then uh, it could not uh, override also for 10 years. So it, it uh, took uh, many so a high damage in the soil and and it uh, could not be over uh, we are not sure that in this uh, in this area is this case but in in Kishkunshak there are more places where no over uh, seeding uh, are successful and uh, the the reason for that that the previous one yard and the pesticide usage was there so um, these are our uh, previous uh, results and uh, as a conclusion so the drought is a is a very big threat in our in our uh, area uh, and uh, the parcels even if uh, you cannot see before the experiment because they are very similar but the, the vari variability among parcels is even high and the diversity um, uh, of the oversown species, species is highly important because uh, you cannot know which uh, uh, year, which weather uh, could be favorable for for a, a, a species, and the soils are also very variable. So we need uh, many uh, species to find out uh, the really um, uh, function of the soil, and uh, we do not uh, use grasses in the seed mixture because the grass, grasses come very quickly in the in the in the area in and then they uh, override any uh, uh, other decodes so at, at the first we do not use uh, did not use grass grasses but later on of course they are coming and uh, the target community uh, have to be the the regionally not uh, from regionally native species and uh, we can find out how we uh, uh, what uh, seed mixtures we use when uh, we look around and in a in a native uh, or, a, or a natural grassland uh, species composition consider and we uh, use the same uh, seed mixture in the same rate of of seeds uh, as in the in the natural grassland, and uh, yeah, uh, I know that in many uh, areas the the there are no local producers of of seeds, and uh, especially not on the regionally native species composition. But uh, hay from the target community uh, can be also a solution for for uh, gathering uh, the the proper uh, seed composition so uh, when when uh, hay from a, a species uh, species uh, rich grassland uh, can be used for, for uh, over seed and uh, yeah the, the long term development of the vegetation uh, when when it is successful then then we can have also stable in the future so thank you very much Thank you. Thank you, Esta, for this presentation and the, the particular view from these more dry grasslands in, in continental Hungary. Um, we are a bit running out of time. 
that's why I would like to postpone questions to the breakout groups and would then come to the final presentation of this uh, series of statements. And this um, will be given by Maria Klopčić. Um, Maria, are you, are you in? Yes, I am here. Oh, fine. Uh, and the presentation, I just wonder, uh, Dina. So I, I may introduce Maria. Uh, she is a professor at the Department of Animal Science at the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia, and she she is uh, from education and 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 profession and an animal scientist, and she's working on a broad range of livestock related topics. That is, uh, housing systems, uh, management of livestock sy uh, systems. But she's also interested in in stakeholder. Uh, involvement and awareness. And today she's, she's talking about uh, experiences on virtual fencing from Slovenia. Please, Maria, go ahead. Thank you very much for the introduction. Good morning to everybody. I would like to share with you some experiences uh, with uh, using of virtual fencing. Um, next slide, please. Uh, virtual fencing is a system that allows farmers to contain or exclude livestock um, without the presence of um, physical fence, instead using uh, an um, invisible GPS uh, boundary. On next slide, you can see how this uh, virtual fence works. So we, in fact, we need two key components, GPS collars, and we need mobile phone um, application. On next slide, you can also see that um, with virtual fencing, animals uh, get some um, sound uh, warning uh, when they came to the first um, virtual virtual line, and if they continue, uh, then they they get electric shock. Uh, the difference between uh, sound and electric um, warning is around one and a half uh, meter. Uh, and this uh, sound uh, increase in the capacity and also in the volume. So uh, when animals are trained and they, uh, uh, they are learning, then uh, they don't continue after virtual uh, uh, sound uh, fence, but they then turn ar around and go back to the quiet part of um, uh, grazing area. Uh, for the training of animals, uh, you need uh, at, uh, uh, some three or five days. And uh, uh, first week, um, you use electric fence, and one line uh, is without um, electric fence. So we have single virtual line, and then on the base of uh, associative learning and some um, negative uh, stimulus, stimulus and experiences with electric shock, then animals mostly uh, learning um, the, the system of uh, virtual fence. Um, on next slide, you can see that uh, on the mobile app, app application, you can follow each animal which is equipped with um, a GPS um, collar, and you can see where animal is located uh, on, the, on the moment when you look, and you can also follow in which part of um, um, grazing area the most of animals are located during, um, during the day or during the, the week. You can also follow the number of um, the sound uh, warnings, uh, number of electric shock, and also how often uh, animals escape uh, over a virtual fence. The use of um, virtual fence has many potential benefits. From the point of farmer, um, you, uh, you can improve management and mon monitoring of uh, grasslands uh, and grazing. So you reduce time and costs uh, associated with the install installation, maintenance and movement of um, conventional fencing. Then, um, uh, Virtual fence also has ability to replace existing physical fencing uh, or introduce fencing in areas where physical fence is not uh, possible. Uh, with the use of virtual fence, we can improve pasture management and feed utilization. 
uh, with the um, uh, use of uh, rotational grazing or strip grazing and more regular moments. We can also enhance monitoring of individual animals uh, within uh, a herd, and we can follow animal movements uh, in real time. Position, uh, positioning uh, is uh, available to view on this uh, mobile app. Virtual fence also provide flexible grazing management, and in the case of bad weather situation, you can move um, animals to the uh, grassland, which is not uh, in danger to be damaged. So if you look on the, uh, oh, then additionally, virtual fence also protects sensitive habitats. If you have some uh, birds in the on your grazing, uh, you can protect with virtual virtual fencing that uh, that animals can go doesn't go don't go to the these uh, habitats. And um, they also protect animals in the mountain areas that they don't go in danger uh, part of um, grazing area. So if we put together advantages and weaknesses, you can see that we have many uh, advantages. So virtual fencing uh, provides simple animal restraint, easy separation of animals. Uh, the system doesn't, uh, doesn't cause pain to animals. Uh, farmers also has, uh, have less work and costs with um, fence maintenance. It's an easy way to control livestock and also we can improve environmental and sustainable, uh, sustainability results. But of course, each system has also some weaknesses and um, animals are not protected from the predators with this uh, use of virtual fencing. And in areas where there is no signal, the system would not work. For the moment, this system is still an exp expensive investment. For research purpose, uh, our costs last year, they were around 300 euro per caller, but for the commercial uh, in uh, use, um, the costs are still around 400 euro per, uh, per GPS uh, caller. On next slide, you can see that in our uh, experiment uh, last year, we had two groups of um, uh, eight Holstein heifers uh, with the age one year. And um, we conducted two separate groups. One was uh, under virtual fencing, another one was under electric fencing. Experiment uh, uh, take, took um, uh, two times 32 days. And all these uh, Holstein heifers in age one year, they were naive, so they didn't have any experiences uh, with um, uh, electric fence and uh, both groups of uh, horse and heifers were balanced uh, again, uh, uh, regarding the age and uh, the weight. Um, during this experiment, uh, we uh, measure uh, leaf uh, weight on the beginning of experiment and also on the, on the end. Um, if you go to the next uh, slide, uh, and then uh, we also took um, uh, manure uh, and uh, uh, the hair uh, to measure cortisol. And all uh, animals were equipped with um, ice cube um, uh, sensors to follow activity uh, on the um, uh, grazing area. And each year, uh, week, we also uh, measure um, behavior uh, with a recording of uh, both. Uh, groups of heifers under virtual fencing and under uh, electric fences. So uh, on this slide, you can see that uh, before the beginning of the uh, experiment, we took um, sample for uh, uh, face, uh, we took face uh, for cortisol uh, uh, content. Uh, we uh, also measure body weight. And then uh, first week uh, of experiment was uh, for training phase. So video recording was on uh, day one. And then uh, each week uh, again for four or, or two, between uh, four and six hours, we collected um, faces weekly uh, to measure cortisol in both groups. And uh, of course, we follow daily audio and electric uh, stimulus 
and uh, with the use of iStack sensors, um, uh, we have all uh, information about daily activities. And then during implementation phase, um, it was around 22 to 27 days, uh, we continue uh, to follow daily activities, uh, weekly facial cortisol, and uh, weekly video recording. Um, on next uh, picture, you can see uh, this uh, grazing area close to blade on the farm, uh, blade and um, uh, one uh, part of um, this grazing area was under virtual fencing and another uh, part was uh, under electric fence. On both um, uh, groups uh, were equipped with water and with mineral stuff, uh, which was available uh, all uh, the all the time of uh, during the experiment. And on next slide, you can see uh, how nice area was uh, for experiment. So it was under the the highest mountain, Triglau. Uh, 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 heifers can look also on the Karavankan and on other side uh, on uh, Bled Castle. So it was very nice area and we also had uh, great experiences with use of uh, virtual fence, so no problem uh, with uh, animals, no damages, and also uh, we saw that even that animals were naive, uh, they learn uh, quickly in uh, in all four groups because we we made uh, one group uh, between um, beginning of July and 10 August, and another group. Uh, between 10 August and 15 September, only one uh, heifer was, uh, uh, which didn't want to learn and escape very often, but people which has ha, which have experiences with uh, grazing and with animals, they say that this is more character and not that they cannot learn. So this was our experience uh, till, the, uh, till now. Uh, this year we will continue uh, with the same group of heifers, and we also try to make uh, experiment with uh, Charolais and Limousine uh, heifers on our research farm in Lugatets. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, for, for this very uh, nice presentation and interesting results on, on a new technology, which is really promising. Um, I just want <laughs> maybe one question aloud before we switch then to a short coffee break. Uh, well, it does not, be, does not seem to be the case. Maybe one, one question, how, how could you know, I mean, animal welfare people are concerned about the electric shock. Um, how, how, could, how are you, can you make sure there's no, no harm to the animal, the technique? Yeah, we, uh, uh, we collected um, faces to measure cortisol because cortisol is st stress hormone. And we compare both groups uh, heifers under uh, uh, electric uh, fence and uh, virtual fence, and there are, were no no difference. So, uh, on the base of our uh, experiences and also experiences from North uh, Island from uh, Connor, uh, there were no differences regarding the uh, uh, higher level of cortisol uh, in the case if we we, we use um, uh, virtual fence. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. Um, Thank you. Thanks a lot. And then we uh, have now a short, a short break. It's it's meant to be only five minutes. We lag a bit behind. Uh, Stanislav, is this a problem, or we still have this this short break of uh, five minutes, and then we will continue? Uh, maybe a comment on this, Stanislav. Yeah, I think we need some break. So yeah, I okay, agree so. to continue with. So, with the break. so we start at uh, half past 11 again. So grab a coffee and is that okay? Yeah, five, five minutes. minutes should be okay, I think. Okay, yeah. So half past, half past, uh, it's in, in Central European time, half past uh, 11, we meet again. Great, thank thanks, you. Thanks for now. Then it's uh, René Schils. Okay. He's already on board. Yeah. Hi, René. Hi there. <laughs> okay, see you soon. Welcome back, everybody. It's now my pleasure to introduce the next speaker. Uh, it is uh, René Schils from uh, Plant Research, Wageningen Plant Research. 
Uh, René is a, a senior scientist in, in, interested in, in various topics about land use and ecosystem service delivery, in particular of permanent grasslands. Uh, and he also plays an active role in Super G uh, um, in, in, in terms of the role of permanent grasslands in Europe in, 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 in view of the upcoming food transition that is required in, in Europe. And, and today, um, René uh, will, be talking, will be talking about exactly this, this uh, issue of, of un unlocking the potential delivery of multiple services from grasslands. So please, René, go ahead. I just wondered, Dina, is the presentation of René on? I, I, I shared it myself, so... Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah okay. please, please, yeah. René, go ahead. Yeah, so I hope everyone can see it now. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Johannes, for the introduction. Uh, so, uh, as said, I'll uh, talk a bit about the uh, delivery of uh, ecosystem services uh, from permanent grasslands. Um, why? Oh, yeah, there we are. Uh, well, as you know, of course, uh, besides the uh, production of feed of good quality, cheap herbage for, uh, for dairy cows and beef cattle, Permanent grassland can deliver many other uh, services. Uh, think about landscape and recreation. Uh, we already saw some pictures on, uh, on plant richness and flowers and pollinators, but also in terms of uh, preventing erosion and uh, helping uh, to have a good uh, water quality in the environment. And then if we look at uh, where we find uh, permanent grassland throughout uh, Europe, so on the left-hand side, you see the, let's say, the proportion of uh, permanent grassland within farming systems in uh, the whole of Europe on the Nuts 2 region. And you uh, see some areas, especially in uh, well, more in the Atlantic regions in the United Kingdom, Ireland, and uh, some other uh, regions where we have more than 70 up to nearly 100% of uh, permanent grasslands. Uh, whereas in uh, other regions in the north of uh, uh, Europe, Poland, Denmark, we also find uh, systems which have uh, less than 30% uh, uh, permanent grasslands. And today we are uh, in a workshop on the continental uh, uh, region. So that's uh, the map on the right hand side. And you see in general that, uh, let's say, the uh, regions with very high proportions of permanent grasslands, so above 70%. Are a bit lower. So there are a couple of regions in France and uh, in Germany, but in general, the proportion of permanent grasslands is a bit lower in this region than if you compare it to the, the rest of Europe. So in my talk, I will uh, address. Uh, um, uh, I'll first look at uh, the farming systems with uh, permanent grasslands, and then at uh, permanent grassland types that we find on, uh, on these farms. And then in the second half, I will talk a bit more about uh, well, how these typologies of farm systems and permanent grasslands can be fitted on uh, the delivery of uh, ecosystem services and how this can help to, uh, yeah, to produce multiple services at one time. So that's what we mean with uh, multifunctionality. So if I then first go to the the farming system typology that was developed within the Super G framework. This was uh, mainly done by the group of uh, Torino, for, so um, but also with the help of other colleagues within Super G. And this uh, typology has uh, five different uh, uh, factors that determine the, the, uh, the farming system type. Uh, first, of course, it's the, the livestock species and the categories. And then it's the, the stocking rates and the proportion of permanent grassland on the farm. And then there is a, a fourth and a fifth level, and that's the cutting and the grazing management and the contribution of permanent grassland to the total forage supply on a farm. And these, the first three levels have been implemented in the uh, in an atlas in, uh, in farming systems, and uh, the fourth and the fifth. We've not been able to do that yet because we really lack uh, spatial information to, uh, to say per nuts free region, uh, what the uh, cutting and grazing management within these regions and what the contribution to forage supply is. So we only concentrate on the first three levels for now. 
Um, and uh, switching back to the whole of Europe first, uh, <clears throat> you, uh, the, uh, the tool that we, uh, that we uh, produced can deliver these kinds of maps. So you can see distribution of uh, the dominant uh, farming systems within the different uh, nuts free regions. So you see uh, that uh, dairy cattle and beef cattle are really uh, dominant farming systems uh, throughout Europe. And, uh, uh, but there are also regions where none of all the farming systems are dominant. So that's really a very diverse uh, region. Uh, similarly, we can look at uh, stocking densities. Uh, so you see that in general, most farming systems are uh, rather extensive, but it goes up to 20% of farming systems that have more than two uh, livestock units per hectare. And the same we can do for the proportion of uh, permanent grasses. So you get these nice figures about the distribution uh, of the proportion of permanent grassland. <clears throat> and of course, we can also look at uh, the continental region again. So that's blended out in the, in the map here on the left. And then we, we, we look at the same factors, so livestock, stocking density, and proportion of permanent grassland. And uh, if you look at livestock, in general, they're not, on average, the continental region looks quite a bit like uh, Europe, uh, the distribution, although there are, let's say, less farming systems with uh, sheep and goats and less, less with uh, mixed ruminants. You can also see that uh, considering the stocking density, that uh, the stocking density on average is somewhat lower. So you find a higher proportion with less than half uh, livestock unit per hectare. And you find a lower proportion with a stocking density of more than two uh, livestock units per hectare. And as I already uh, said in the beginning uh, of, of my talk, the proportion of uh, uh, permanent grassland is slightly lower if you compare it to the whole of Europe. So, uh, so the proportion of farms with more than 70% is uh, well, around 20%, whereas in the whole of Europe, it's more than 30%. Then I'm uh, moving on to the typology. This was uh, mainly developed by Bettina Tone, who is now in uh, Tfibel in Switzerland. Um, here we distinguish six different factors that determine the, the permanent grassland type. So first of all, it's the, the presence of management, whether the grassland is managed at all or not. And then the, the presence of woody plants is uh, considered. Uh, the renewal interval, so how, how often is the grassland uh, re-sown, uh, grass on grass uh, renewal we are talking about here. Uh, the intensity, again potential productivity, and also the cutting and grazing management. And I'll walk you slowly through the typology. So like I said, first we have to distinguish the, between managed and unmanaged uh, grasslands. And then with, within the managed grasslands, we distinguish uh, grasslands which have more than 10% of uh, shrubs or woody plants, or less than 10%. And within this last category, we consider the uh, what we call the semi-permanent uh, grasslands, which are renewed uh, well uh, with a with an interval of less than four, fifteen years, and then the what we call the really permanent grasslands, which are renewed uh, less frequent, so at least above fifteen years. Um, and then within this last category, again, we have three levels of intensity, so from uh, low, intermediate, and high intensity. And these intensity levels, they are uh, determined by the amount of nitrogen input, uh, by the cutting frequency, and by the amount of uh, livestock grazing days per hectare. And these three combined determine uh, in which, which intensity class uh, uh, a grassland is uh, categorized. Um, and then we just a bit too quick. Then within the intermediate intensity and the low intensity, we also distinguish the potential productivity of the region. So you either have regions which, which have a 
high uh, potential production, so no water stress and uh, higher temperatures in general, or you have marginal regions which, uh, which, uh, which have regular drought stress or are in general in regions with lower temperatures. And finally, then within each uh, type, you distinguish grasslands which are mainly cut or grasslands which are mainly grazed. So those are the, uh, well, all in all, nearly 20 different uh, types of grassland that we're considering. Um, here, this work is uh, still in development. So here we also are trying to, uh, to create a spatial representation, so, uh, so an atlas, where you can find in which nuts three regions what kind of uh, what the probability what the probability is that we will find a certain uh, permanent grassland type and this is still like i said work in uh, work in progress and so for each of the uh, types we are which is in fact the legend of the atlas we will uh, produce so-called portraits and these describe let's say how in general where of course where, where we find these uh, permanent grassland types how they are managed but also what kind of ecosystem services are delivered by these uh, different pg types and underneath this level of the portraits we have another level and these are the so-called case studies and these are descriptions of real fields that exist somewhere in Europe and that are, let's say, characteristic of these kind of uh, PG types. Um, then going back to the, to the delivery of uh, ecosystem services, so we want to see uh, in the end of, uh, if you look at the different farming system types and if you look at the different uh, PG types, what kind of ecosystem services are delivered by these different farm systems and these different PG types. But also we are really interested what the effect of management is on the delivery of the ecosystem services. And to find out a bit more about that, we did a very extensive uh, systematic review and I'm just summarizing it here in two slides, but it's, uh, you can read more about it in the, associated paper um, so but we looked up at all the literature in europe over the past 40 years that had diff which studied different kind of contrasts so either different land use contrasts so where they compared permanent grassland to cropland or permanent grassland to temporary grassland or permanent grassland to forest or papers where they looked at different management interventions so that could be nitrogen input, grassland renewal, cutting and grazing frequency, number of species, and the use of legumes. And for all these papers, we assessed what the effect of these uh, land use and management was on these six different ecosystem services or biodiversity and ecosystem services. And in total, we scored around 18 indicators that represent these different uh, ecosystem services. So all in all, we, uh, we, uh, we extracted nearly 700 papers. So we, st uh, and these were read and uh, the data were assessed. And so we, we, uh, we scored the, the, the land use contrasts and the uh, management contrasts on these uh, different, uh, uh, in these different papers. And you can see also that the the number of papers we found is a well, uh, some uh, relationship between the number of papers and the permanent grassland uh, fraction in the different regions, which we also expected and which uh, came out a bit. So uh, lots of papers in the Atlantic region, but also here in the continental region, quite a lot of papers on uh, on permanent grasslands. So all in all, our conclusion, our conclusions from uh, from the study was that when we really want to increase multifunctionality of permanent grasslands we need to first we need to protect these grasslands uh, so that they are not plowed into temporary grassland or into cropland but also 
considering from management point of view, we really need to extensify these uh, permanent grasslands uh, uh, to increase the multifunctionality. Um, then just a uh, small word on function multifunctionality. So what do, do I mean with that is that if you look at the land use and management intensity, which is on the lower axis and on the Y axis, you see either the provision of feed. You see that with increasing land use and management intensity, you will have a higher uh, feed uh, production, higher quality of feed. But on the, let's say, the ecosystem services uh, like water quality, climate regulation, so let's say the environment, we generally find an opposite relationship. So with lower intensity, uh, higher delivery of ecosystem services that are positive for the environment and also uh, for biodiversity. Although at the very low end of the uh, intensity, biodiversity might be lower again. But here we are really looking at multifunctionality. So we are more or less adding up these different uh, provisions of ecosystem services. And then you see that we somehow, and this is just a qualitative uh, picture, but really the idea is that we, from the very intensive systems, like in the Netherlands or in Belgium or some regions in Italy or France, we really need to move down this line to a more lower intensity to have a more a higher multifunctionality. And when you are in the very extensive uh, farming systems, you might, you don't need to, but you, there is also still something to be gained uh, in terms of multifunctionality. Um, then finally, we all want to bring this together in one framework. And this is really just a thought at this moment and very much open for discussion. But you see, uh, you see the different criteria that I talked about. So the proportion of permanent grassland, contribution to forage supply, intensity, grassland use, potential productivity. And these are all uh, criteria that determine the farming systems typology or the permanent grassland typology. And you have different land use options or different management interventions. And this list can be much longer and longer, just, just what you like. And then we, what we are aiming at, and again, this is just provisional, um, that we really want to see well on this kind of farming system with this kind of permanent grassland, we think that moving from, let's say, increasing the proportion of permanent grassland or reducing the intensity, uh, increasing the species richness, that will increase the multifunctionality of permanent grassland. So, and this and can either be used by policymakers, consultants, or farmers to see, well, I'm in this kind of farming system with this typology, and these kind of management options are then suitable for my farm to increase multifunctionality. And with that, I would uh, really very much like to thank all my colleagues in the SuperG team, because this is really the work of many people within SuperG, and uh, well, open for questions. Thank you very much, René, for this very nice uh, schematic uh, uh, or conceptual uh, thoughts on, on permanent grasslands and, and their, their role in providing ecosystem services. And it's open for discussion. I already saw that there was a, there was a hand raised. Uh, ah, where is it? Please. Yeah, I saw one from Damien, I think. In Damien, the, yeah. yeah, yeah, but I'm not, I'm not sure. But... It disappeared it's again. Funny. So if 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 not, I I may I may I may start maybe Rene. I mean I I I'm really fond of of the typology, and the giving us the opportunity to to really look at more precisely on the effects of management on on ecosystem services depending on the environment or the conditions. So this mm -hmm. is really really helpful. Now my question is. If we are going to produce more ecosystem services, how are we going to assess the amount of service that is needed at a larger spatial scale? So many of the services are, are provided not only at the paddock scale or the alpha scale, 
but they are they are provided at the landscape scale or at the farm scale. So mm -hmm. how how do we how do we bridge this this scale uh, uh, issue? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a very good question with for which I actually I don't have a very simple answer. But I think the the whole issue of uh, let's say the, the the monitoring and the assessment of the delivery of the ecosystem services really depends on the yeah on on the delivery so um, some like feed production of course we uh, usually have uh, depending where you are in europe but in general we have quite good farm data uh, in management systems where we can assess uh, feed delivery for instance if you look at uh, for instance uh, and you can calculate greenhouse gas emissions also for farms um, if you talk about landscape or perhaps water quality, surface water quality, then it's much harder to uh, to assess direct relationships between the managing management on one farm and, uh, and and the quality of the water or the, the landscape in, in a larger region. So you you really have to uh, rely then on other monitoring systems, uh, which can either be uh, let's say remote sensing monitoring or uh national monitoring programs on water quality uh, etc so and, and those have to be then reallocated reallocate, somehow to farm farm systems or groups of farms so that's uh, that's quite a challenge i agree yeah yeah okay i mean maybe maybe a, a following question is uh i mean if, if you look for example at the farm scale taking a dairy farm mm -hmm. i mean they are relying on on really good herbage to some extent I mean to yeah. keep the livestock. Otherwise, mm -hmm. they would have to in in to to buy in uh, forages or, or, or concentrates. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, such a farm may also cope with some sort of nature conservation grassland, not not <clears throat> the total area, but parts of it. Mm -hmm. So how do we assess this? I mean, so that at the farm level, it it seems to me that we need to combine various utilization either intensive extensive or whatever and then looking at the farm scale how how what is the provision of a farm in ecosystem service yeah well i, I we personally i have a lot of experience of course in the, in the netherlands and we have a, what, what we call a, an a, a, yeah, an assessment tool for farmers um, and this needs to be uh, so if they want to sell milk in the netherlands to, they need to fill in this tool, and this tool, uh, so it it it, uh, it, it monitor or you have to register how much feed you use, how much fertilizer you use, and this is all uh, uh, checked, and then they this tool calculates all kinds of uh, uh, key performance indicators, and these also more or less um, are um uh, equivalent or say something about the ecosystem services i talked about and you you can have different levels of uh, so you have a basic level which you everyone needs to uh needs to get to to deliver milk to the company and then you have got surplus levels above which you are paid an extra cent or a couple of cents per milk more than uh, than the basic level. So, and that's really a very strong incentive for farmers to, uh, to try to comply that and to find the right balance between, let's say, feed production and delivery of other ecosystem services. Because there, I agree, there is a quite a bit of a trade-off between feed production and feed quality on the one hand and all the other ecosystem services. Yeah. Right, thanks, uh, Ray. Are there more questions? Well, this does not be to seem the case. So I just wonder whether we then split up uh, into these uh, working groups. Uh, so thanks again, Rene. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, and and now I'm 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 returning to to Stanislav for Dina maybe to split up it has already been done or is it uh, or shall I do or just Stanislav please give me some advice. <laughs> Joanna think... is going to explain if you want. Perfect. Yes. Okay, Dina. 
Nice. Yes. Thank you. Um, just to add, I, I have now assigned everyone to a specific room. I will open the rooms and you will receive a message um, stating that you will be sent to room X. Um, these breakout rooms have a duration of 30 minutes. And when it's five minutes left on the clock, I will send a message to everyone just so you know that you have to wrap up discussion. Don't forget to have someone taking notes so that when you come back to the main room, you can have an open discussion on the outcomes of the different rooms. So in just a minute, you will receive the message to, to invite <laughs> and invite to join the other rooms. So maybe I, I, I should start with conclusions from our uh, first group. And uh, we were uh, we were a group uh, with very active Slovenian colleagues, so they uh, they contribute the most. Uh, so concerning uh, the ideas uh, for the next webinar or for the uh, for the uh, some activities of uh, within the Super G. Uh, they, there was uh, the response that in Slovenia uh, the dairy farming uh, is uh, closely linked to permanent grassland because uh, this is quite small country with very small area of arable land per one inhabitant and uh, the dairy farmers need to need to link uh, high forage quality for the feeding of dairy cows together with uh, uh, with the demands of uh, protectionists sometimes and sometimes they are facing uh, of the climate change on the shallow soils uh, it's more common drought during the uh, summertime or summer months and they would like to to know some way how to manage their grasslands to keep good quality and yield of forage and also to fulfill, fulfill some uh, requirements for the uh, protection of environment and uh, uh, offer, offering or service or providing ecosystem services. Yeah? So uh, this was the first direction of uh, Simon, one farmer. Uh, also, one, if I mention everything, there was also the troubles with the big predators like wolves uh, in Czech Republic and also in Slovenia, probably also in some other countries. So sometimes uh, there's a very slow response of the government to pay some uh, uh, some money to farmers who lost animals. So it's uh, quite... Uh, complicated process and many farmers uh, refuse to continue farming due to these troubles with the big predators. Uh, also, the, the, the environmental conditions are very different, even in small country like Slovenia is. Uh, there are Alpine regions, Pannonia regions, so it's not easy to find a, a solution for all the regions especially in the agri environmental schemes, because they are usually uniform for the whole country, the terms are the same, etc. And also uh, many farmers in Slovenia and also in Czech Republic uh, have no idea uh, or not, they would like to have some response or the, uh, some, uh, some proofs that the agri environmental schemes are really effective because sometimes it seems that uh, uh, it's very demanding for the farmers, but there are no results, real, uh, real results, for example, increasing biodiversity or some other. So it would be useful for farmers to have uh, some responses from the government or some bodies who are checking this, uh, these uh, programs. What I have else, there is also troubles with the pesticides on grasslands because uh, companies are not willing to to pay uh, for registration, especially in small countries. So sometimes it's big troubles to to control effectively the weeds or some pests on grasslands 
and also it's a big trouble, uh, especially for organic farming, because there are no pesticides or especially herbicides uh, allowed. And there are some tr uh, trouble with uh, weeds like dogs or thistles, which are very difficult to manage without the pesticides or uh, there are missing uh, effective treatments against this, against this, uh, this, these weeds. Uh, maybe I have some notices. Uh, Daria, what I forget? Help me, please. Uh, administration. I can see also the administration administration troubles with the agri agri environmental schemes that it uh, takes plenty of time to farmers and uh, as I told you, sometimes they don't believe that it helps. Uh, okay. Okay, so probably that's, they were the most important things. One more uh, is also the contribution from France and Czech Republic that uh, there is uh, uh, some incentive to support the tree's presence on pastures uh, in the framework of uh, agroforestry or especially silver pastoral system. Uh, it's subsidized in both countries, but some farmers do it also without these financial incentives. But uh, especially in mountain regions, farmers uh, feel the trees as an enemy, so they don't like to uh, to plant some trees on their pastures because they have enough uh, around the pastures and the trees are going uh, to the pastures without their... Uh, and uh, no, they would like to keep them away from the, from the pastures in mountain regions. Okay, so it's probably the last mention I have around the first group. Okay, um, Stanislav, I, I, am I still the moderator? Uh, probably, yeah, I would be <laughs> so <laughs> thanks, if thanks you can continue with it. Um, maybe maybe we, we go through the three different groups and, and collect the results and, and then maybe uh, some more minutes for, for a general discussion. Is that, would that be okay? Okay, so I, I just uh, presented uh, the result of discussion in, within our group. The okay, first so group. Then, then we go on with the second group. Um, who is going to, to present? The second yes, group is was, Esther. Perfect. Yes, I, I was uh, leading because uh, Maria left us. <laughs> so um, we, we have uh, discussed mostly with, uh, also with <laughs> Slovenian colleagues. Uh, they are coming for, uh, from the, if I could understand, from the Triglav region, so far uh, a little bit far away from from Vlad, but uh, it is also much more, yeah, uh, um, uh, mountain area. But uh, it was a, an interesting uh, question I could not uh, <laughs> answer, but uh, some um, uh, problems uh, maybe with the fr uh, virtual fencing. If uh, the animals are there, and uh, yeah, they can feel the 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 sign because of the of the curtain. But uh, but uh, when tourists or or anybody walk around, is is the, um, was a question if it's not a danger for them because they they could not see where the the fences so the and the animals are there. But I I thought that. Um, and uh, try to answer that these animals are not so dangerous. <laughs> so maybe it, it may be not a problem. Yeah, for, for the people, it's also better when they can see the fence, where, where is it? But uh, yeah, so it, it is just a, a little conflict, but, uh, but uh, maybe in the, in the, in the area uh, with, with virtual fencing. Um, another, um, uh, question was, uh, or on a question, just a discussion on the irrigation in the mountain area because, um, or or when when the drought is higher, uh, the the animals need also drinking water, and it is a big challenge because it is a trade-off between the drinking water when too much irrigation is uh, uh, using water. Then the, the drinking water may come out, so it is also a problem in a dry period in, the, in that area. And 
also uh, sometimes yeah it is also um, a challenge when sometimes the the field is too wet and sometimes too dry so the hectic uh, uh, phenomenon of the water, uh, groundwater is is uh, is also um, a challenge. Another challenge is that there are the arable lands because of the slopes. So uh, sometimes big arable areas are um, uh, established instead of uh, of um, um, splitting them with with hedge hedge rows and uh, uh, the the some farmers think that it is very um, so it is uh, not so necessary there this uh, this um, hedge so shrub row there and they cut them and then the erosion um, increases so it is also a problem in the in the areas where the where the slopes are are uh, a bit bad. and also uh, this uh, protected uh, uh, against wind erosion because the wind is uh, also a problem there. Um, uh, another interesting uh, um, problem or not a problem or idea was. Uh, but also uh, Stanislav mentioned that uh, the the people like do not like the uh, the trees on the on the field, but uh, um, the, um, not, not a shy opinion was that these orchards uh, may uh, have more um, usage, not only yeah the the fruit on the trees, but also uh, increasing the biodiversity with more birds, more insects, butterflies. So uh, not a, 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 a thick uh, forest, but uh, some trees on the area may be also um, favorable than, than only the grasses all around. And it, it may increase the uh, increase the biodiversity as well, and and also the usage of the of the of the grassland. And uh, in, in that uh, case, the the mowing is much more uh, difficult. So, but the grazing is uh, is then better because the the animals has shading area when they uh, when the sun is too. Um, uh, much and and the, the in the summertime uh, in the warm or hot uh, summer days these uh, trees uh, may serve as, as shadow for the animals as well so, yeah for the grazing is better the tree on the <laughs> field but for for uh, moving for for um, so it is uh, for meadows it is Better. So more complicated. That, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it it was uh, the oh. conclusion and and all that we have talked about. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, thanks, Esther, uh, for, for for concluding on that group, and then maybe we we go directly to the third group. Um, and and Simona was taking uh, notes. Uh, Simona, would you be prepared to 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 give the the summary? Yes, yes. Please. I'm sorry, I'm not able to use my camera, so I just would summarize it. So uh, we, in our group, we, we identify some challenges for the future. Um, uh, the first one uh, was agrophotovoltaic. Uh, the second one, the problem of erosion. Then uh, ecosystem services communication also irrigation and how to um, convince far farmers to, uh, to hold water at their land. Uh, another issue we discussed was carbon farming and also as like as previous groups, uh, predators. So as far as photovoltaics, our conclusion was uh, that uh, 
Um, there, there could be challenge which could be positive if we will use it together with other farming systems. So there is a need of research in this field to be able to maximize uh, benefits we can obtain from the land. Uh, on the contrary, uh, there are also the problem that uh, these uh, photovoltaics are installed uh, in marginal areas where they can compete with the natural protection issues. So it could be also problems. Um, as far as uh, all ecosystem services, um, we conclude that uh, there is a, a need to improve communication with services to public because uh, we need uh, public um, to see all these uh, services we can, we should overcome this um, view of non-productive land, that uh, grassland is non-productive land, and also overcome the negative perception of uh, carbon, and um, especially uh, regarding the milk production and so on. So this uh, ecosystem services should be communicated as simple as possible. So there is a need, um, to find a way uh, to communicate more attractively, um, to simplify this message to be understandable for public. Uh, another big issue we discussed was uh, water and irrigation and how to convince farmers that water is important. So uh, maybe um, to show and demonstrate benefits to farmers um, to have uh, water and to be able to hold water at their land. As far as new challenge of carbon farming, there is a need to, um, to have a deeper research to be able to, to communicate again um, the services which can we deliver from this point of view. And um, predators, there is a big issue, but only relative uh, to, or in relation to some marginal areas where there could be some competition between the natural protection and production, but uh, it's a special issue for marginal areas but still we need to, to pay attention to this problem. And uh, we also discuss how to convince farmers, how to show and um, uh, we concluded that there is a need from our side to show um, demo or to demonstrate benefits which uh, these uh, ecosystem services protection and management option could deliver. And also there is a need to simplify agro-environmental schemes, which can uh, enhance these activities. So I, I, I'm not sure if I catch, caught everything. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Simona, for this. I think it, is, it covered quite well what, he, what we discussed in, in the group. Um, and now the question is, are there any additions from the audience to the results we have seen in the different groups? I mean, these were, these were the summaries, but maybe you would like to mention uh, some particular aspects. That's why I'm asking the whole audience to, to contribute and to, uh, to, to take while well, this does not seem to be the case. Um, right. Uh, Stanislaw, please. Yeah, I, if I can, I have one, uh, uh, one remark. I would be very, uh, very glad if it's possible to put together the information about uh, carbon farming in particular countries, because I think uh, there are very different uh, conditions in, uh, in uh, particular countries within uh, Europe. For example, in our country, there are two companies uh, which uh, which uh, offer uh, some income to farmers. Uh, but as I told in my group, uh, the 
the rules are not clear and maybe it would uh, it could help if uh, there is some system which is uh, well arranged and def defined and it could be an inspiration for the others and it could be also a very good opportunity for grassland farmers to to have some diversified income so it just mentioned for me yeah very good point i i mean it's it's, it's uh we may we may keep this in mind for for also plenary discussions within super g that that because it's it's quite an ambitious topic i, I see the point but maybe we take it on the agenda for for the next plenary uh, uh, meeting uh, to discuss this as well. Whether we could give any do any contribution to this issue. Yes, thanks. Right. Um, I mean, if if there is no urgent need for further discussion, I mean, we are we are almost over the time. Uh, it was intended to 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 finish at half past twelve. It's now almost one o'clock. Um, I wonder, maybe Stanislaw, um, wh whether there is an opportunity to collect those those summaries we got. I mean, would the, um, the, the 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 those who have taken notes would they be prepared just to 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 make really? It's 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 not not a written thing. Just take the keywords, what we discussed, and that this might then be shared among the group of today, so that we have a nice reminder on what was discussed. And we could also contribute this to to others being involved in super g or might be interested is would mm -hmm. that be a suggestion would, would those who have who did the summaries would they be prepared to 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 do a short list of items that had been discussed in the in the different groups right. so, so we, we can then send it uh, send, uh, this, you know. pardon i didn't understand Esther. Oh, didn't understand okay okay Oh, Dina, was it? Sorry, I didn't. Oh, who was? I, who was? I, I didn't get it. It was Esther. <laughs> yeah, it, it was <laughs> Esther from Hungary. <laughs> oh, was it Esther? Sorry, it was Esther, Esther. from Hungary. Yeah, I just asked uh, if it's uh, good when we uh, send it to Stanislav or to Dina or both. It's... Yeah, maybe both, and then oh, they yes, can please. read it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Of, of course. Okay. Oh, no. Stanislav, you, you. I mean, you, you suggest. Okay. Okay. So I think. Uh, we anyway need to uh, need to uh, put together all the all the notices uh, all the remarks from all the, all three groups together and uh, and make some final uh, final file from uh, from this meeting uh, but anyway i would like uh, to uh, to put it together also with other bioregions uh, which was atlantic uh, alpine is done now we are the third one and boreal and probably mediterranean will follow and uh, it would be i think also interesting for the participants uh, or attendants of today's webinar to to have some uh, uh, some ideas and uh, the remarks from different regions because it can be inspiring also for them and we should be in contact uh, with the people who attended this uh, this webinar also in future so we have your email addresses and uh, i think uh, after the discussion within uh, within super g we could provide you uh, the basic uh, uh, conclusions from from the particular webinars but uh, if uh, if i can uh, if i can uh, wrap, wrap up today's uh, today's uh, meeting uh, I'm glad that uh, we had very good number of uh, attendants and uh, all of us could see uh, very different uh, contributions or presentations uh, from a different part of this uh, Super G project. And uh, concerning the discussion, uh, some, some things are similar to other regions, as I could see the Atlantic and uh, and Alpine, uh, there were issues concerning the climate change and uh, uh, drought, uh, which are bigger, bigger trouble for farmers. There were the same troubles with agro and schemes, which are sometimes too complicated and uh, demands plenty of administration. Also, the carbon farming was uh, an issue for the other webinars. And uh, 
the of course the climate is a little bit different than the atlantic and alpine regions because generally we have less humid climate and the proportion of permanent grassland in continental region is lower so the importance of permanent grassland is also lower compared to arable farming but still i think the importance of permanent grassland in this continental region is uh, is high and i think it's uh, it will be even even bigger in future because the uh, ecosystem services which are provided by permanent grassland will be more uh, uh, no will be more strengthened in the in the future by government etc so it's just uh, my notices without very good preparation. So sorry for that, but I will be uh, glad if anybody else have some uh, other remarks or would like to add something to me. Right. Thanks, uh, Stanislav, for for this this comment. Uh, is there any reply to that or any any addition? Um, I mean, I'm I'm happy to 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 see. Uh, maybe the, the notes and you may I just wonder whether you may spread it first uh, around the delegates of today so they can comment on the notes and then uh, convey okay. to, to the whole group of super G so that might be an idea and mm -hmm. I was just wondering whether the presentations of today whether they I mean if the if the presenters are uh, okay with it would be spread also or, uh, among the delegates of today only I mean then then this would then then be a, a nice a document uh, to remind this uh, this webinar of today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it can be available through the web pages of SuperG. So I'm okay. not sure, Dina, how it was done in the previous webinars with the presentations. Sorry. Um, Are the yes, presentations okay. available for the attendance? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I was going to say that at the end. So we will uh, send a, a link with the presentations that uh, will be available for all the, the people that participated today. And also uh, we will um, put the, the webinar recording if uh, we have ah, that okay. consent. Uh, on the YouTube channel, okay? The rooms are, were not recorded, okay? Just the presentation, so the, the discussion would still be slightly private, but, uh, but we can gather all the, um, all the topics that were discussed in a, in a document. And then okay. as Sanislav said, I would uh, also discuss this with Jauker because he's the one that um, leads yeah. this task. And um, and it could be good so that we can have, for example, a compilation of all the of all the workshops from the different regions and have a, a kind of a dissemination material on that. So um, it's something to be discussed. Yeah. Well, that sounds that sounds like a plan. Nice. Uh, thanks mm -hmm. a lot. Uh, <laughs> looking forward to the results. Right. Oh, I think uh, in the of, with this we can we can close. I think uh, we had a we had a really informative um, uh, morning. Uh, I I would like uh, to thank first of all the presenters of today for for their willingness to to contribute with a pr presentation and putting issues into the fore. Uh, so thanks a lot for 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 you and but also thanks to the organizers uh, Stanislav and 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 Dina and. Uh, uh, who was the guy, who was, I mean, I'm not- All the consuls, I, I think, helped very much. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, yes. So I'm, Yes, Ruan and Alexander, please. Alexander, <laughs> yes. They are okay. the one working. I'm just here to give some oh. oral support. <laughs> thanks, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. It, it was all very well organized. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy. Um, and I've also uh, wished to thank uh, the audience. Uh, we got quite a nice, quite, quite nice uh, discussions in the, in the groups. So thank you all, and uh, that's for that's for today. And I wish you a nice weekend, a relaxing one, hopefully.